morning and welcome to Bethany United Methodist Church where we are leading people to experience God's love, to know Jesus Christ, and to grow in his image. We're delighted that you're worshiping with us today. My name is Sherry Clifton. I'm one of the pastors here at Bethany. We want to extend a warm welcome to you as you worship from wherever you are. We are so delighted that uh, we can know that with the Spirit's presence, we worship together even when we are apart. I want to encourage you today to make sure you check out the church website that has updated information about what's happening here at Bethany and how you can continue to stay connected. We know that you are interested in, in knowing when we open in person, and we want you to know we're in conversation about that. Your health and your safety is our top priority. And so in the coming days, uh, as we continue to hear from you uh, from the survey results that we've sent out last week. We just hope that you will uh, continue to be patient with us as we try to communicate and make decisions for you and for all of us. The website is the best place for you to keep going for information about what's happening here. I just want to encourage you in that way. The website's also a great place for you to register your attendance, to submit your prayer requests to us, and to continue giving financially to support the ministries of the church. As we continue in our worship this morning, I invite you to stand where you are to sing with us as we worship God this day.
finding myself at a loss for words. And the funny thing is, it's okay. The last thing I need is to be heard, but to hear what you would say. in my eyes to see your majesty to be still and know you're in this place please let me stay and rest in your holiness word God Finding myself in the midst of you, beyond the music, beyond the noise, and all that I need is to be with you, and in the quiet, I hear your voice, the word of God. in my eyes to see your majesty to be still and know that you're in this place please let me stay in rest in your holiness the word of God speak would you pour down the grave wash in my eyes to see Let us pray. Lord, in this stillness and in this quiet, we pray that you would allow us to hear your voice as you continue to speak into our hearts and into our lives, into your church, into this community, and into this world. Speak your word of truth and mercy your word of love and compassion, your word of light and life and hope. As these days impacted by the pandemic continue, we are living in a vortex of competing voices, telling us what we need to think and do, telling us how we should feel, and sometimes it's hard to hear your voice above it all. And honestly, Lord, sometimes we forget to listen for your voice above it all. As we worship today, remind us what your voice sounds like. Remind us that as your beloved children, we do know your voice and we can trust your voice to lead us and guide us, to comfort and to calm us, to reassure us and give us peace. As we listen for your voice, we are grateful that you hear our voices, our prayers that have words, and our prayers for which words just don't come. Our prayers of gratitude, and today we are grateful, especially for those who have served our country and made the ultimate sacrifice, giving their lives, protecting us and our freedom. 
As we remember them today, we remember their loved ones as well, who also paid the price in guarding our freedom. Our prayers for help, for wisdom, for our leaders, for courage in the face of uncertainty, for a deeper dependence on you, for answers in these days. Our prayers for healing of bodies and minds and spirits, healing of relationships, healing of communities, for healing of the brokenness all around us. Our prayers offering ourselves to you, releasing fear and worry, releasing our anxiety and frustration, releasing the things that get in the way of your love, pride and greed, stubbornness and prejudice, our apathy and our blindness. As we release these things to you, help us receive what you offer in their place. Peace and hope, confidence and trust, humility and joy, kindness and generosity and compassion, the transformation of our hearts and our lives that we might more faithfully love you and one another. Hear our prayers, Lord the ones we've named and the ones that remain deep within us. Hear them as we offer them to you. In the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you're just now joining with us in worship, welcome. We're glad that you're here. We encourage you to look at the church's website for updated information and for ways that you can stay connected. Today, as we prepare to give ourselves once again uh, with our gifts, our financial gifts, we want to celebrate and, and give thanks to you for your generosity in supporting the ministries of Bethany. Mission and service, ministry and connection are still happening. And today we celebrate the six new members who joined our church last week in our online, our first online connection celebration we're excited that they have decided to connect to the Bethany family and find new ways to grow in their faith through our community and in service. We want to remind you that when we have people join our church, we remember the vows that we make when we join the church. And so we extend a warm welcome to them and we remember those vows. I invite you where you are to welcome them with these words. We rejoice to recognize you as members of Christ's Holy Church and bid you welcome to this congregation of the United Methodist Church. With you, we renew our vows to uphold it by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. Thank you for continuing to uphold the church with your gifts. Your generosity makes a difference. Brought me into his streams, river of living water. Turned my bitter into sweet, all my burdens were lifted. He took the shackles off my feet. And there's no sound louder than a captive set free. Yeah. 
Thank you, guys. Good morning and welcome to uh, Bethany. If you're just joining us now, welcome to Bethany United Methodist Church, where we are leading people to experience God's love, know Jesus Christ, and grow in His image. Um, I am looking up here, and I am not seeing my proper slides, Frank. Uh, so if somebody will kick me over. We're going to start off a, a series this week for the next four weeks. We're going to be talking about unfailing grace. Uh, this is not only Memorial Day weekend, this is also, also Aldersgate Day within uh, the United Methodist Church. Now, I'm trying to remember how to do this, Frank. I want to pull that off of there. And uh, I, I know that sometimes uh, some of you are thinking, well, you know, what is that and what's, why is that important? So I, I want to remind you uh, on May 24th of 1738... An important event happened in the life of John Wesley, who is the, the founder of United Methodism. Uh, and we have a, a section out of his journal from that night. Can you guys bring that up for me while we're getting this straightened out? So uh, that night he writes in his journal, In the evening I went very unwillingly, you hear that? Very unwillingly, to a society in Aldersgate Street, where one was reading Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans. Gracias. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. This uh, important moment uh, in John's life kind of marks a turning point in his life. It marks a turning point in his understanding of his relationship with God. It's critical to understand this, to understand who we are as Wesleyan Methodists. Uh, and I think there's a critical piece of this for all of us to understand uh, for who we are as Christians. So I want to invite you in this morning. I'm going to try to kind of give you a little bit of the backstory on this and also help you understand why this is important. Let's pray. Almighty God. We give you thanks for this day that you've given us today, and we just ask that you come and fill us with the presence of your Spirit. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Now, at the time that John Wesley penned those words, he was almost 36 years old. He is a priest of the Church of England, and you kind of have to think, well, how did you become a priest of the Church of England and not understand that your sins were forgiven? And how is it that you got to be 36 years old within the church and not understand that? Uh, and you may ask that question, but I want to uh, 
suggest to you that uh, Wesley was not alone in that, that there are a lot of us that walk that same path with him. Now, Wesley was born uh, in the church. Uh, his dad was pastor of Epworth. Uh, and this is a, a recreation of the uh, rectory that's there. Uh, the original one burned down and it was rebuilt, and this is what was rebuilt in its place. Uh, this is where John grew up. He studied under his uh, mother, Susanna, primarily, and uh, his lessons included learning Greek and Hebrew and Latin, as well as memorizing Scripture. I would guess that by the time Wesley was getting ready to go off to college, his biblical knowledge was probably more than most of us uh, when we graduate from seminary. It probably is certainly more than what I had when I graduated from seminary. Uh, it, it was dr drilled into him early on, uh, time after time. Uh, early in his life, there was a pivotal moment when, when the house caught fire, and there's a great uh, famous painting of this event where John Wesley was trapped on the second floor of the building, and at the very last minute, uh, a, a human pyramid basically was formed, and they snatched him from an upstairs window uh, just before he would have been uh, incinerated, basically. Uh, his mother always considered that a sign of God's uh, providence and that God had a special purpose for him and, and kind of passed that on to him. So he grew up a little bit with that, which I'm not sure was to his advantage. Uh, but nonetheless, he always considered that God had a special calling on his life, even from a, a very, very early age. His dad, as I said, was the pastor of Epworth. Uh, this is the church there in the village. Uh, that church was built over 900 years ago. And uh, it's still in use today. When we went there, the steward of the church explained to us the length of time that church had been there. And the way he helped us understand that was he said, for you Americans, uh, uh, you remember that the, the pilgrims landed on Plymouth Rock. And, and what year was that? And everybody was about 1620. Yeah. Yes, he said, so when, when that happened, my ancestors had already been worshiping in this church for 500 years. And we went, oh, thanks. I mean, but kind of letting us know, you know, that they, they had been around a lot longer. Uh, but this is the church uh, John would have grown, John and his brother Charles, the whole family would have grown up in. This is the baptistry in that church where he was baptized. Uh, it's the same one uh, that he was baptized in. And having grown up in that environment, uh, he grew up with an understanding that God had called him. His plan was always to be a priest of England. So he attended Christ Church College at Oxford University. Uh, this is what you see as you walk up to the campus. Uh, if you actually go inside the buildings, uh, you'll find the Great Hall of Christ Church. And uh, as you look at this photograph of this great dining hall, if it looks a little familiar, this is the one that the great dining hall in Hogwarts and Harry Potter is based on. This is where it came from. Uh, and, and while we were walking through there, there were myriad people in the whole capes and everything. And, and I'm going what is up with these guys? And, and my wife had to explain it to me that they were Harry Potter fans and this was a famous location. Uh, but you can see this is a, a building that's been in use for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. This is the church, uh, the Cathedral of Christ Church. Uh, this is where he would have worshipped during that time. And indeed, it's in this space that both John and Charles would be ordained priests of the Church of England. So they would come through that. Now, the, the interesting piece of this history that starts here at this point John goes through uh, Christ Church, graduates, he's ordained. He actually goes back to Epworth to serve the church he grew up in for a couple of years, at which time Oxford invites him back down uh, to serve as a tutor and to do a few lectures there on the campus. He comes back to Oxford a year after his brother has begun his education at Christ Church. And Samuel, in his first year, uh, basically kind of wasted the year in riotous living. Now, I know that's a, a new concept for many of you, uh, but I want to promise you that your freshmen still do the same thing. Uh, sometimes things don't change over time. And, and Charles realized at the end of his first year that he had pretty much wasted that year, uh, and it probably didn't hurt that the college was telling him, you know, if you don't straighten up, we're, straighten up, we're going to kick you out. And, and so he, he formed a group, an accountability group, uh, that would help him to uh, focus himself as he moved through this time. Uh, George Whitfield, another great evangelist, was in that group. And when his brother wa was returning, uh, he reached out to John and said, would you be our spiritual director for our group? And so together they began what became known as the Holy Club, a meeting in the mornings for prayer, uh, accountability, uh, Bible study, communion, uh, and, and then going about their day. And they met every morning and went through this routine. Uh, they visited prisons uh, frequently in the afternoons. The other students at Christ Church saw this going on, 
And, and it doesn't take a lot of imagination, I think, as a, if you think back to when you were in college, to understand that the other students were somewhat skeptical of the holy club that met every morning. And they began to make uh, fun of it and say, oh, those guys, they think they have figured out a method for holiness. And so the word Methodist was originally a derisive term that was applied to them while they were in college. But that group also became a model that Wesley would build on later in life. He and Charles, when they graduated, Charles was then ordained, decided that they were uh, going to go out for greater things. They came to uh, the Americas, uh, the colony of Georgia, to serve uh, Christ Church in Savannah and also to evangelize the Native Americans. They were abysmal failures at both of those. Charles lasted one year before he fled back to England. Uh, somebody actually took a shot at him. Uh, John lasted two years before he fled back to England with a writ for his arrest uh, because he had uh, alienated basically the governor's family. Uh, and, and they went back to England really in a pretty uh, depressed state of mind and heart. Um, now on the way to Georgia when they were sailing over their ship had encountered a major storm. And in the midst of that storm when everybody on board the ship was terrified and, and afraid they were going to go down and they were all going to drown. Uh, they encountered a small group in one of the cabins below decks who were in a circle around a candle and were singing and were praying and were reading scripture. And they said, aren't you afraid? And they said, no, we're, we're not afraid even for our lives or for the lives of our children. And they were impressed. These were Moravians who also were coming over to be missionaries. It impressed them the depth of their faith and the assurance of their faith. So when they come back to London, and they're in London proper, dealing with this sense of failure, uh, depression, uh, failure as, as people, as priests, as, as everything, uh, they count on a gentleman named Peter Bowler, who was a Moravian, and Peter invited them to one of the Moravian society meetings that met on Aldersgate Street. Now, Aldersgate literally was a gate through the old city walls that were there at that time. Uh, all of that was destroyed in World War II in the bombing raids. But if you go, you can find the marker um, there where the gate used to be in the area. Uh, it's really about two blocks from St. Paul's Cathedral. It's quite close. And, and just adjacent to that, you'll find this bronze uh, flame, which has Wesley's journal entry inscribed upon it. This marks what is believed to be the actual spot of the room where they were that night. Uh, when John had this experience of entering into the presence of God. Uh, and in that moment, you know, something very powerful happened that transformed Wesley's whole life. Uh, readings were being read from the Book of Romans along with uh, Luther's preface to it. And some of the passages that, that might have influenced him include Romans uh, 3. Apart from the law of righteousness of God, uh, now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate the right, his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. In the fifth chapter, Paul writes, Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. You see, at just the right time, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
Since we've now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Now hearing that, pieces begin to to come together for Wesley and begin to click in a way that he'd not understood before. Uh, And it's important for us to kind of listen to what Wesley was thinking and and how that came out in some of his later writings. The first is that that Wesley really held to original sin much in the way that everyone else in, uh, in the orthodox part of the Christian church did and understood it. Is man my nature filled with all manner of evil? Is he void of all good? Is he wholly fallen? Is his soul totally corrupted? Or, to come back to the text, is every imagination of the thoughts of his heart evil continually? Allow this, and you are so far a Christian. Deny it, and you are but a heathen still. Wesley didn't always mince his words, uh, and you'll notice that as we use some of his quotes. But, but what, what is important to understand is that his concept of original sin was not substantially different from anyone else's. He believed that, that though we were originally created in the image of God, in the fall we had been totally corrupted. Uh, and, and so, you know, he held to that. Uh, it, you hear it reflected uh, when he writes, neither say in the heart, I cannot be accepted yet because I'm not good enough. Who's good enough? Whoever was to merit acceptance at God's hand. Was ever any child of Adam good enough for this? As he's writing about that, what you also need to hear in that is that along with that concept of original sin was the concept of provenient grace, that that God didn't simply leave us in that place, but that God's grace was already working in this before we knew it. Now, God's grace sometimes gets defined as God's undeserved, unearned, loving action on our behalf, God acting for us, out of love before we've done anything to earn it or deserve it and God's prevenient grace is that grace that comes before we're even aware of it Wesley would say that 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 prevenient grace is given to us a gift at the moment of our birth it is with us it's what allows us to understand that we have a need for God Uh, he would tell you that if you have any moral conscience if you have any way of knowing good from evil, if you have any sense of the deficiencies of who you are, it's because God has given them to you in prevenient grace. Uh, this is part of God's gift, is to wake us up to who we are and our need of God. Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you, this, this definition of original sin and this kind of concept may sound a little rough to our modern ears, um, because sometimes what happens with this is we begin to hear this as a way of comparing ourselves to other people. Uh, Well, you know, I'm not really any worse than Bob over there, or I'm not really any worse than Sally over there. That's not at all what Wesley's talking about. What he's talking about is how we compare to the very image of God that we originally were created in. Originally, as being the image bearers of God, we were supposed to be uh, something that, that anywhere we went in the world carried God's blessing with us. And anytime anyone looked at us, they would actually know what God looked like. So, So just for a minute, think about yourself. And think, if I could follow you around for a whole week, without being creepy, if I could follow you around for a whole week and watch everything in your life, would I come away from that and say, well, that's exactly what God looks like. Now, I think most of us, in all honesty, know that's not true. Uh, We don't want to admit it because we're afraid to admit it. And really, Wesley's first part of his life was spent in that place. He was aware of his limitations, but he felt he had this special call in his life. And so he, he struggled and he strained to try to make himself worthy of God, which is an impossible task. And too many of us are, are stuck in that place. So, so we struggle and we strain. We have this obsessive pursuit of trying to justify ourselves. I'm, I'm I think that's probably something uh, that lends to the uh, rather um, pervasive of being offended of our age. You know, heaven forbid that anybody should say anything that offends us because we live in this kind of place of insecurity of knowing that we're really not who God has created us to be, but yet wanting to justify ourselves, which is very much the story of the first 35 years of John Wesley's life. But what you hear in this passage is is John writing to someone who had said, 
in response to that description of original sin. Well, I, I can't be accepted. I'm, I'm not good enough to come in the presence of God. And John first says to him, you know, you're right. No, no one is. That's, that's the point of it. While we were still enemies, while we were still sinners, God proved his love for us by offering Christ for us. That's the gift of grace and the next piece of grace. Beyond prevenient grace, which makes us aware of our need for God, is the gift of justifying grace. And Wesley would advise one of his people uh, to look for it, your salvation. Look for it just as you are, unfit, unworthy, unholy, by simple faith, every day, every hour. Don't, don't try to wait until you've made yourself good enough because you never will be. That's the whole point of grace. Is, is that God's forgiveness is poured out on us while we are still who we are. We come to God as we are, and God's forgiveness was poured out on us, and we are claimed as God's children. We are claimed as God's beloved before we have become who God intends for us to be. One of his genius is that he separated that concept of justification, which is that great work which God does for us in forgiving our sins through the atonement of Christ, what sometimes is called justifying grace. He separates that from regeneration or the new birth, which is accomplished through what we call sanctifying grace, that great work which God does in us, renewing our fallen nature, so that once we have been forgiven and justified, God's Spirit begins to work in us to restore us back to that nature that we were originally created in. We're, we're works in progress. But the difference is instead of straining forward trying to prove ourselves and trying to justify ourselves, we know that God has already claimed us in love, that God already holds us in love. And so our work is not an effort to earn God's love, but it is a response to that love that's been poured out upon us. It's a gift that has been given to us. In the early uh, 20th century, William Fitzgerald uh, coined what's called the four alls of Methodism. It was all people need to be saved from sin, all people may be saved from sin, all people may know they are saved from sin, and all people may be saved to the uttermost. Now that word may in there is key because in Wesley's theology, God's grace is always both freely given, but it also allows us to respond. It's called free and cooperant grace. Uh, God gives the grace, grace to us freely, but we choose whether or not we receive it. We choose whether we accept that gift into our life and allow it to be at work in our life. And as Fitzgerald uh, wrote these words, uh, which you hear in the first part, all people need to be saved from sin is that concept of original sin. All people may be saved from sin, that concept of justifying grace, that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. And so God has forgiven what has come before, and we are restored into a right relationship with God. All people may know that they're saved from sin, something that's called assurance. Uh, Wesley believed that, that once you'd had that experience like he had that night on Aldersgate, not only could you be in a right relationship with God, you could know you were in a right relationship with God. And that incidentally became one of the major sticking points in theology in his day and age as to whether you could actually know that or not. It caused division uh, in a number of places. But he believed that you could, just like he said that night. I know that you know my sins, even mine, are forgiven. Uh, to be in that place and uh, that understanding, that freedom that comes from that, and then to be saved to the uttermost is the gift of regeneration, new birth. Uh, also, sometimes we'll use words sanctification. He sometimes talks about being made perfect in love. Uh, and so these kinds of concepts that allow us to understand that, that we are not, you know, just left where we are. But once that forgiveness takes place, God gives us grace to begin to move forward from there to re be recreated in the very image that we were supposed to have to begin with. Uh, and so you have uh, Fitzgerald kind of summarizing that here and picking it up, this idea of, of knowing, knowing, knowing your salvation and living out of the joy of your salvation uh, Sounds a lot like Paul's words to the Romans, doesn't it? Romans 8, 15 to 17. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship or daughtership. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. It's important to understand that the Abba is not simply a translation there, but it's a very particular form of the word Father. It's an intimate form of address. Of address. Uh, and it might be translated better Daddy, 
than, than Father. It, it, it signifies not simply that we recognize God as the heavenly Father, but we recognize God as being in this intimate relationship where God is in love with us and we are in love with God. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I mean, this, this idea that, you know, not only can we be saved, but we can, we can know that. We can know that we're in this loving relationship with God, that we are God's beloved children, that we can call God daddy, and that God claims us as his children. This is an important piece of this theology. And in Aldersgate, all that comes together that night for John Wesley. It all comes together. And he moves from an obsessive pursuit of his own salvation to a blessed assurance of it. And John hoped and prayed that all the people called Methodist would come to that same point in time. So this morning as you hear this, on this uh, Memorial Day weekend and also on this Aldersgate Day, I, I, I don't know and I, I can't see your faces, so I don't know how you're responding to it. But, but if you're thinking, well, you know, I haven't had that kind of momentous thing, that's okay because in some of John's letters, we hear that some people had these great aha kind of moments that happened all at once. Some people, it was a more gradual kind of response. Uh, and that didn't matter to him one way or the other. What mattered to him was that you, you get to that place of living from an assurance of your salvation and being open to what God was doing in you to recreate you into the image that you were supposed to be carrying. That's what mattered to John. And so as he, as he urged the people to do that and he urges us to do that, I want to say if, if, you, if you're in that place this morning and you're not feeling that you are living from the joy of your salvation, you don't feel like you live there, uh, heed John's advice uh, you know, look for it just as you are, unfit, unworthy, unholy, by simple faith, every day, every hour. Don't, don't put it off. Don't say, I can't do that. Beseech God every hour for that in your life. Uh, reach out to God every hour. Petition God to make that real in your life. Uh, beg God to make that become a reality in your life. And don't stop until it does. I mean, John had a tremendous head start on all of us, having grown up in, in the church and, and a household in the church, being schooled from an early age uh, and, and all of this. Uh, he has such a head start on all of us, and yet he's, he's 35, almost 36, before this becomes a reality. Years ago, when I did a walk to Emmaus for the first time, we came to the end of the weekend. And one of the gentlemen on that walk who was a leader in the church and had been, and I'd known him for decades, uh, who was well up in his 70s at that point in time, got up at the closing and said, this is the first time in my life that I have ever experienced the love and grace of God. Now, that was one of the things that sold me on the walk to Emmaus, but it also just impressed me so powerfully that, that he could be in the church for over seven decades and only now be experiencing that so powerfully, that joy. So I, I want you this morning to reach out to God. If you've not experienced that joy in your life, to reach out to God and to commit to keep reaching out to God until it becomes real in your life. This is part of the great gift of Wesley's legacy. And it's what makes this day so powerful. I want you to pray with me this morning. Almighty Father, we come before you. And we confess that past all of our denials and all of our defensiveness, uh, we do know, we do know our failures and our brokenness our spiritual disease, our sinfulness. We understand that. And we are sometimes reluctant to come to you, not trusting in your goodness. But come this morning upon us. Fill us with that knowledge that indeed your love has been poured out for us, that you have come to be with us, that in the offering of Christ in love, you have made us right with you. Let us be filled with that knowledge that, that our sins, even ours, even mine, are forgiven. That instead of trying to, 
to earn our way into heaven. Instead of trying to justify ourselves, we might know that you have done that work for us and set us free from that. We might live from the joy of our salvation and be open to all that you want to do in us through the indwelling of your Holy Spirit. So let this be for us the altar's gate moment when we come to understand the power of this grace and the power of this love. Father, we come this morning and, and we ask you to pour out upon us this assurance of our salvation. We ask it in the name of Jesus Christ who offered himself for this moment. Amen. My brothers and sisters, um, if you want to know more about this congregation or you want to have some further conversation around all of this, uh, there's a live chat on the side of your feed and uh, you can engage the folks there. They'll be happy to talk with you or direct you to a different conversation or direct you to the Zoom prayer room uh, where you can be in prayer, but uh, they're there to assist you this morning. So I invite you to reach out to them uh, as we go through this. Uh, we are going to uh, move into a time of proclaiming what we believe. We're going to use the Apostles' Creed. It's what I call the expanded version of it, uh, which simply means I, I took the pronouns out and I put Jesus' name in as a way to remind myself uh, about two years ago uh, that this really is about what Jesus has done for us and what God continues to do for us. So I invite you to join with me. Uh, if you are able, I invite you to stand with me as we share together these words. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Jesus was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. Jesus descended to the dead. On the third day, Jesus rose again. Jesus ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Jesus will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you for being with us. And again, if you have questions, uh, reach out to the folks there on the live chat. Uh, I invite you to remain standing, and we are going to invite God to build his kingdom here. Your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made.
I'll get, I'll get you going, a little out of breath. Uh, so as you go out on this day, uh, remember tomorrow the Memorial Day observances and honor those who have offered their lives uh, in service of our country uh, and show them proper uh, honor and uh, uh, proper respect for that offering of themselves. Uh, but on this day, on Aldersgate Day also, as you go out, uh, seek with all your heart in every moment uh, the outpouring of God's grace upon you and the assurance of the joy of your salvation. Uh, may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you. Amen. <laughs> Shalom to you now, shalom my friend, may God's full mercy bless you my friend. Shalom, shalom, Christ be your shalom.